a warm, warm welcome. So let's start. I think we have most people here. And it's interesting because when we decided to do the session on football and leadership, as, as, as I'll tell you a little bit about, about VGL, but actually this idea came from, um, it came from Ahmed, who is one of our speakers today. And in a discussion that I was having with Ahmed once, um, Ahmed was mentioning, so he's a leader in a company and he's also a football player. And I remember he was talking about um, how excited, so he was sharing leadership stories with me about manage, managing his team, working with his team, but relating it to his football experience. And the way he spoke about leadership and football, it was just so beautiful and so inspiring. And so this idea of hosting this VGL really came from Ahmed. So thank you, Ahmed. It was his inspiration. Mm. And we have today 90 minutes to woo you, to excite you, to share insights with you. And we're, we're really looking forward to doing that. Um, we have, so just to tell you a little bit about Vienna Global Leaders. Vienna Global Leaders, what we do, it's a global leadership community. Um, we have, it's dedicated to uh, connecting, to developing and inspiring leaders in a complex world. We host different events um, and it's really bringing leaders together and experts together to discuss leadership issues, share best practices and some of the challenges we, we, we face. Uh, and that is, that's the aim of VGL. This year we have um, only put together four different VGL events, forum events. And we started with one in April, which was uh, women in leadership. We have this one now, and then we go into, in September, we have our next one, which is on millennials. And we close the year, I think in October with another session. So thank you for joining us. I'd like to quickly do an introduction to myself. So my name is Pari Namazi, for people who don't know me. I am an executive coach and a leadership facilitator. I work in a boutique consulting firm called UNEPA based in Vienna. And without further ado, I would love to uh, introduce our speakers to you. So our first speaker is Kat Khosroyar. Um, Kat uh, is an e American Iranian. Um, I'm gonna do a very short intro to her and then hand over to Kat to say a little bit more about herself. And then we'll go to Ahmed and then Pascal. So Kat, uh, as I said, Iranian American, she was the head uh, coach of the Iranian national women's football team. And so at a time where we don't talk much about, uh, you know, you don't associate women and football that often, but here we have not only a woman coach, but the coach of an Islamic Republic women's team. So there are many stories which Kat will share. Um, Kat, for you, we have a special cheer and I'd like to just share that cheer and then hand over to you. A warm welcome to you. This is Kat, a warm welcome. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me to this event. Um, I never thought of myself as someone that could speak at a forum like this so when it you know, involves leadership in football, but uh, I will do my best to keep up with the momentum and to you know, give you some insight of a country like Iran where most people never associate it with women's football, but uh, it was honestly the best, uh, best role for me as an individual who's growing within the whole football community to learn all the fundamentals of mental toughness uh, in a country like Iran. So thank you for having me today. Thank you, Kat. And, and maybe just a quick question to you. Um, tell us a little bit about your background to football, how you got into football. Well, um, I was born in the U.S. And in the U.S., as most of you know, it is a country where the women's national team always wins the World Cup, Olympics, uh, you name it, they're winning. So foot, or soccer or football, as we should say, since most people are in Europe right now, it's uh, one of the most prestigious, prestigious, prestigious games in, uh, in the U.S. for women. I started playing when I was five years old because my father needed an outlet for me to just calm down because I had way too much energy. Apparently, I drove everyone crazy. 
And one of his friends told him that, you know, why don't I just, you know, start playing soccer? That will completely deplete me. And I started at the young age of five and he thought it would just be, you know, a, an activity for me. But, you know, one thing led to another and I was getting more involved in the soccer community. And he was noticing that I had talent in it as well as my coaches. So uh, I ended up getting on the state team and from the state team, I was invited to play in the Olympic development program, which is where you get noticed by the national team. And then from there, I was actually um, invited for a national team training camp for the US. Then uh, that same summer, uh, junior year of high school, I, um, I was about to go to my senior year. I decided to come to Iran for a few weeks of vacation and uh, you know, just to kind of reconnect with family on the other side of the world, especially that I found out about 17 years, uh, when I was 17 years old that I was Iranian that I should um, at least see where, where is this country? Why, um, why have I not been told more about it? And uh, when I came to Iran, it was instant, um, instant attraction. I fell in love with the country. I fell in love with the hospitality, with the, the fact that I was so close to my family. But one strange thing was that they didn't have women's football, but they had something called women's futsal. Um, I started playing... I started playing with those women and, uh, you know, I think word get, got around really quickly that there's this American girl who's tackling us and, you know, shooting the ball, crossing, jumping, heading and all of the above. So um, word got around to the football federation that um, I'm here, I'm in Iran, and they came to me and they asked me if I would be willing to join them for the first uh, women's national, national team after the revolution. And, you know, I would be helping to make history. And as a 17 year old, that's like, that's, that's exactly what you want to hear, uh, especially if you want to play for a national team, because my dream was to play for a national team, but little did I know it was going to be for a completely different country. So I accepted and I decided to stay in Iran, decided to be a part of the first national team as a 17 year old and to, you know, try to, to help women, uh, you know, jump these crazy barriers to become uh, role models for the future and to, you know, keep that gate open so more women get involved in the game. But that's a little bit about uh, my background and my involvement in soccer, football. Thank you, Kat, thank you. And I know having spoken to you earlier, there's so much more to share about this journey of being in Iran, adopting this new country and, and also the work with the, the women, inspiring them and also giving them, sharing this passion for sports. And it's interesting because we sometimes think women, it's, it's a different passion that women might not have the same passion for football, but I know so many women who are so passionate about football. So it's, it, it's really lovely. And, and I know we'll come back and, and ask you some of these questions about you know, how, how you inspired them and, and um, took the team forward. Um, please, um, uh, I just wanted to mention, if you do have questions for our, part, for our speakers, please put them in the chat box. We'll come back to those questions. We do have a Q&A session a little bit later with the speakers, so please um, just write them and we'll try to pull out the questions and ask. And, and maybe to give you just an overview of how we have selected our speakers, um, uh, I think in our, in our um, title for football and leadership, we said a coach, a uh, a player and a leader walk into a Zoom room. And it's exactly that story because um, Ahmed for us, and we're just gonna get to Ahmed. Ahmed is the bridge of the person who plays football, but also is a leader. Kat is the football coach and Pascal is the leader. And it's, it's really bringing these diverse people together and sharing what are the stories, what is the learning that we can, we can get from, from sports and from leadership. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Ahmed. Uh, and I said a little introduction about him and that's what he is. He was a professional football player till the age of 17. And then he changed course in his career and he went into the corporate world. Um, and he's gonna share a little bit about his story with us. And I know he's a passionate football player and I know he's an amazing leader and a team leader. And before you start, Ahmed, we have a special cheer for you. Ahmed, 
<laughs> you have to also tell us what that cheer means to you. Please. Uh, this is a very famous uh, song for um, uh, fans for the biggest team in Egypt. And this is the team that I was playing in. I was lucky to be part of this team for a couple of years. Um, and uh, this is actually one of the, uh, even after changing the career um, from football to the corporate, still running in my DNA, how I learned it from this, from this club and how I'm applying it in my uh, professional uh, career. So um, again, that I'm Ahmad, I'm, um, um, as a service, driven, um, service program manager, um, I had an opportunity to work in several regions. So I have uh, a background for dealing with different people from different regions. And as Perry mentioned that uh, I was ex football player, but I didn't stop. So I'm still playing football, but not on the large scale. So I'm playing uh, five aside teams two to three times a week. Um, and I'm keeping this habit because I believe that this is the, the, the thing that uh, can keep me motivated, energetic, and moving forward. I'm still learning from the football, even if I'm playing in a five-a-side or from the previous years. And I'm still learning even when I'm watching the football. So football is something that I can say it's part of my life, big part of my life. Yeah, thank you, Ahmed. And, and maybe just a quick question. Can you share with us one of those, I don't know, uh, football moments which, which you know, inspired you? Yeah, so on, on, on the general level, I can say that uh, I will take you back to 2004. And there was um, a final Champions League AC Milan, the biggest, strongest team in the world against Liverpool, which was okay. They was okay in, in, at this moment, but the point is um, AC Milan in the first half, they scored three goals. Mm. And in the second half, Liverpool had a significant comeback. They scored three goals and they played penalties and Liverpool won. The idea here is the speech that happened in the halftime from the coach to the players and from the players to themselves. They start talking to each other. Um, this is something that I believe that this is a big lesson that we can learn a lot from how we can motivate the team in a very hard time and making sure that they are moving forward, forward and achievable. So playing and of course, that uh, um, the team here can understand if you are playing against the, 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 the most the Chinese team in the world, they have the best player in each position. And you, they score three goals and you have 45 minutes only to return back. So it was hard, but um, the team has um, the spirit, the belief, the trust between each other and um, common goal. This is something I believe that make, uh, made the difference mm. to achieve the, the third. So this is the big moment for me. Of course, there are a lot of other moments as you used in the video, um, the comeback from Liverpool against Barcelona, um, what happened from Barcelona to um, Paris uh, in the Champions League as well. So a lot of significant moments, but this particular game was uh, slightly different because at this time, AC Milan was the best team in the world, no question. They have best 11 players in the world. So for me, this is one of the moments that I'm still uh, learning and remember and learning from it all the time. Yeah, and thank you for that, Ahmed. It's that, it's that you know, that you take those moments and learn from it and, and bring it into your own life. And you use these powerful words, belief, trust, common goal, spirit. And, and that's in a way what we also bring into leadership, we bring into teams. So really nice that you use that and I'll come back to to um, you later on to ask a little bit more about that I'd okay. love to hand over to Pascal
We can't hear you, Parry. Parry, you seem to be on mute. We'll change my headphones. Yeah, that's okay now. Can you hear me now? Now it works. Now it works, okay. Sorry about that. So I was <clears> saying <throat> Pascal is, last but not least, he is a leader, he has a diverse, background in a, ver a variety of companies. And he is also a coach. He's an executive business coach. So not only does he lead um, you know, a team and an organization, but he also coaches different leaders to perform better. And I hand over to Pascal. Before I do, of course, you're going to hear a very special cheer. But uh, after that, we'd love you to introduce yourself a little bit and tell us about a leadership moment of significance for you. And this is Pascal's cheer. Yeah, we, we won't hear Ali Libre too, too often in the next few days, unfortunately. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Pascal. I'm French, as you might have guessed by now. Um, and so I think I've might, as might, of myself as a true cosmopolitan. I've been lived in a lot of different countries in the past 25 years. So as Parry explained, I'm currently um, an international CFO for a company called Cerner, which is a, a US healthcare company. And before that, I had different uh, leadership roles in companies like Johnson & Johnson, HP. So uh, very early in my career, I, I was interested in uh, the role of lead of manager and managing people, managing team, helping people to grow. And that's also one of the reasons uh, why at some point I decided to train as an executive coach to continue um, uh, to learn new skills, to help my teams, but also help leaders um, enhance their own leadership skills. And so as far as I can tell, football has always been a passion for me. Um, I've only played two years football when I was eight uh, in a small village where I grew up in France. And my really my, my first um, memory about football, it's the World Cup in Spain in 82. And it's a, it's a big and sad memory, I must say, because of that semi-final between France and Germany that was so dramatic and with that dramatic aim for France. And to me today, when, uh, when I... Uh, when I look at how football and leadership are intertwined, I always think about that semi-final in 82 and also the semi-final in 84 at the Euro between France and Portugal that France won. And at the time, I remember Michel Platini who was our like star player. He said, we won against Portugal today because we lost so dramatically to Germany two years ago. Had we not lost to Germany, we would not have won against Portugal. And for me, for a long time, that sentence has stuck. And I, I did not really know what to do about it. And when I started uh, working in companies, leading teams, that sentence came coming back. And to me, after a while, I could really understand what it, what, what it meant. And basically, it meant that the true cement of the team at that time, that was the learning from the failure of 82. So mm -hmm. they had, because it was essentially the same team in 84. And all the people had gone through that uh, failure together. They had learned from it together and they were able to play even better in 84. And that's how France uh, won their first title. Um, mm. and, and to me, that's, the, that's a little bit the essence of leadership or one of the key characteristics of leadership, like being able to fail, mm. to make mistakes and to learn about those mm. to improve. Uh, so today, uh, I hope, uh, We'll have a lot of opportunities to exchange on football, leadership, what we can transfer from one side to the other. Uh, I'm very excited about that discussion. Pascal, thank you so much. And, and I, I think, what, you know, again, what you just said is so valuable. The <laughs> lessons that we take from failure, because failure is also part of, there's so much we learn and grow through that and also being able to accept that. So really powerful. And, and we will come back to that question later. Um, and thank you all. What we're going to go into right now is a session where um, we will uh, have a few questions to Kat, to Ahmed, to Pascal. Uh, as I mentioned, we, when we put the session together, um, we did an interview with each of them and actually pulled out from their rich background some of the 
uh, the, the nuggets that they shared with us. And we're going to deepen this a little bit in the call, uh, in the session now. Um, but please, if you have questions, put them in the chat box. After this round that we do with Kat Ahmed and Pascal, we will share, take up some of your questions to share with them. Um, cool. So I will start with Kat. Uh, Kat, you know, when, when I heard your story, one of the things you talked to us about was mental toughness. You have 90 minutes, this adrenaline rush, pray, playing on a pitch with the, with the teams, getting them up to a point where there, you know, there was this pressure of a country watching you. How do you keep the team hungry yet humble? And how do you cultivate this mental toughness and help them focus? What, what, what did you do? So this question, I mean, I was having a very hard time trying to find the right answer because as someone who is a professional athlete, your goal is to win. Your goal is to play um, the best of your abilities. So, but as a coach, it's a very different story because you have you know, you have the responsibility of not just 23 players, but you have the responsibility of 80 million people uh, that are um, looking at you and want to, you know, feel that joy whenever you win as well. So that pressure is a lot for a, not just the coach and the team, but for the whole country, because they want to see the team succeed. Uh, I regularly uh, would have to think outside of the box. Uh, to keep the girls motivated and you know we worked very hard to to get the results and good results if possible uh, because that is equivalent to respect now coming from iran uh, women's football is not uh, deemed as the um, as the go-to job but it is deemed as the the sport of the nation so whenever we started opening the doors to women's football this already was a um, motivation accelerator. People were very excited to see women play. And, uh, you know, we would, I would get uh, calls and messages like, you know, don't worry if you don't win. We're just really happy you're playing on the field. And I'm like, you know what? Like, thank you for your message, but I'm going to train my girls as hard as possible to win this game. It's not a matter of like, pat on the back. You guys are, you know, just the fact that you are able to put a jersey on, you know, we're proud of you. But you know, each, um, you know, each player, they had a different methodology as far as um, dealing with pressure. And I had to figure out the key to each player of how to motivate them for not just those 90 minutes, but whether we win or lose or like during the halftime talk, how would we be able to keep these players on um, the, the high of motivation? And it all came together during the game day because we trained for it. Um, I made sure that the girls were constantly um, being uh, being mentally trained as far as like with the pressure and also if we're winning, what can we do? And if we're losing, what can we do? But the motivation always came uh, on game day because it was trained during uh, practice sessions. So uh, I had various methods for various players. Um, some of my, you know, players that were very, very shy and I couldn't, you know, get that the straight dialogue with them, I would just have to have like the five sets of keywords for them or just like a little action of like giving her um, an energy drink or patting her on a bank, a back or just winking, like so, some of that would work. But other players, I have to have psychologists work with them uh, before in the middle of or before the game, in the middle of the game or even after the game. But, you know, it, having 80 million people uh, watch you, I think that by itself is a big motivating uh, key that uh, was very significant for my role as head coach for the national team. Mm. Kat, thank you for that. And I, you know, you talk about the, 80 million people, the, the eyes of the nation on you. And that in itself is so much pressure. Um, and, you know, one of the things you said, it, you know, getting these calls from people that it's just being there is enough, just representing us is enough. But your ambition was greater than that. It's, it wasn't, it's not enough. It's, it, it's also pushing them to feel the achievement of winning. Uh, and I exactly. love, yeah. Um, and I, I also really loved how you said that you motivated people in different ways. And it wasn't only knowing how to motivate different players differently. There were other people who supported you. You had psychologists over there. Can you tell us a little bit about that role? What, what the larger team did to you know, support everyone for that common goal and common vision? 
Well, I, I could give you a great example of this. It was our game versus Belarus in Russia. Uh, Belarus is a European team. They're very far uh, ahead of us in the FIFA ranking. They wear Nike. They have, you know, a army of male coaches that were all, you know, they all played in the European league or they played in some top league and all of them were tall like the Eiffel Tower. So we were all, you know, they were towering over us and we were just like little tiny people playing against them. But um, when we saw the, the Belarusian team the night before in the hotel, my girls were freaking out. They're like, they're so tall. They're going to eat us alive. We're going to be just, you know, a, a gold bag. You know, we might as well just forfeit. But me and my small group of female coaches and psychologists, you know, we had uh, about, you know, an hour meeting with the girls. And then we would break out and have like group meetings individually with the players and this, you know, this kind of showed me the resilience of um, a team or a country like Iran, where women uh, just started playing soccer that, you know, although there is an instilled fear that, you know, you're playing against a team that has, you know, the best equipment, the best of everything, you can still, I mean, we, we have two legs, two feet, or sorry, two, two arms, I hope we all have to be, uh, two eyes, and, you know, we've all had uh, the type, uh, the, the training, the facilities, we've all had uh, adequate enough, we had an adequate time to get ourselves to that level, so there is no reason for us to have that fear. Having stress sometimes is good, mm -hmm. stress actually helps me uh, to perform better, um, but some players, you know, they were having a panic attack the night before, so we would have to just, you know, get inside of their psyche, to you know, get them out of their own head is what we would call it. But um, you know, just by showing them a lot of videos and images of the other the opponent, just to kind of get them ready mentally with uh, who are we playing against, helped tremendously. And the psychologists, what they would do was, you know, they would make the girls write in journals. And I never believed in that until I saw how much it changed and had such a positive impact on the team. That writing down your fears and also what you've done good throughout the day will help significantly over time. And like I said, it wasn't an overnight process. We did have the psychologist work with us for a few months before these um, tournaments and games. And I was seeing the, um, I was seeing the, the answer and the, the light at the end of the tunnel with my players. Kat, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank really, you. really valuable insights. We have um, one or two questions that have come up for you, but um, in the chat box, we'll hold on to it till we take the Q&A. Um, I'd love to come to Ahmed. And Ahmed, I know you have this passion for football and I know you still play. And one of the things you told us is that you now play five-a-side football. Uh, and I'd love to explore that with you because that comes together without having a, a coach. It's more an informal team who comes together. Who becomes the coach? Who becomes the captain? What, how does the team work together? What, um, how do you build, create team spirit and drive and, and trust in a team without a coach? Yeah, this is actually one of the things that uh, make the five aside uh, games um, most, um, actually more difficult than having a structured team. Um, maybe you know the five players that you play with, or maybe not. And, um, Maybe um, the, the, the atmosphere of the game is um, uh, funny and nice, and maybe not. Uh, but the most important part, which is the, the thing that we, uh, in this kind of games that we're trying to do is communication. So communication means people, the five uh, players talking to each other, uh, um, understanding the common goal that they have, what is the purpose of this game, what we need to do, how we are going to do it. And this agreement and alignment has to be done before starting the game. And during the game, and by the way, in five-a-side um, games, everyone is a leader. But there will be a leader for leaders. And everyone is a leader means that everyone is allowed, allowed to provide feedback to the others talk on behalf of the, of the others, um, uh, guide the others. But on the other hand, there will be a leader for the leaders, which is someone who can protect the team players against the other team. He can talk to referee, he can represent the team. And this is coming and 
it's actually not agreeing that we can identify X to be a leader. It comes because the people start trusting someone. He is focusing on the uh, um, objective, playing with mind and heart. This is something very important. If you are playing football, not only the football, the in, in, in business as well, if you do the business with mind and heart together, you will be passionate with what you need to do. You will have your target in front of you always and working hard to reach. And everyone will be convinced that you are doing something valuable. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what we are doing in the fire side. And also um, the, uh, the communication, trust and respect, because again, we are not in a formal team. We are people that they are doing something else in their lives and playing football for two hours a week. So um, we, um, everyone is doing or leading some, uh, something in his business, etc. So the respect is something very important. And this is also reflecting on the business. Um, we have the, the, the respect is the key word in leadership. Everyone is important, regardless if he's good in what he's doing or not. He's uh, important. Um, I remember that one of the examples that we have, uh, we were playing um, a game and we were uh, four players working hard and someone unable to cope with us, the, our first player. Um, so at this, at this moment, we decided that it's our responsibility to give him a trust to perform more. So we tried hard to give them to give him this trust and he he improved yes improved because he felt that we trust him although that he is not a very good player he was losing the ball uh, missed uh, the uh, the ball um, many times but again we put him in this situation trust give him the responsibility and the people start reacting accordingly mm -hmm. um, on the other hand um, in, 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 in leadership, usually, I guess that the, the respect and communication and feedback are three golden uh, words in overall uh, leadership um, situation. If you need to be succeed, you have to listen, regardless if you, if you are the leader or not, but you have to listen to the others. Maybe someone can give you feedback and I'm always saying that the feedback is a gift, but it has to be wrapped as a gift. Mm. So we need to be very careful in providing the feedback mm. to be accepted and the people can move forward with it. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. Ahmed, thank you. I mean, you, you brought up these big words of communication and trust and respect and feedback, and we always know they're valuable, but it's so hard to do, right? for something like that to happen, the team has to, well, they have to trust one another and they have to have a sense that they're being treated fairly and equally. How do you, how does that happen? Um, how, how is as, fairness? As, yeah, as I told you that uh, specifically for, for, for this kind of games, that everyone is important and everyone has to uh, has a role to play if anyone fail to play his role the whole team will fail it's slightly different than the big teams 11 against 11 because someone if he failed the others can cover him but in this kind of games it's too hard if someone failed mm. it's too hard to be uh, covered so um Everyone feels that he's important. As I told uh, you in the beginning, that in, in these kind of games, everyone is a leader. Mm -hmm. And this we are uh, saying this to each other. Mm -hmm. Everyone has the right to talk on behalf of the team, to give a feedback, and also to guide the team. Okay. But within these players, we can identify someone who would be a leader for all leaders. Mm -hmm. This is how it works. Um, Usually, uh, the, the, the people, we are treating each other equally because, again, if this communication or level of trust has been broken or touched, the whole team will be collapsed. Yeah. And this is very sensitive. This is, has to be also 
um, uh, considered in the uh, corporate life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because this this link is very important. Everyone, he, regardless what he's doing, but he needs to feel that he's doing something valuable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, so again, you're you're um, underpinning the the values of trust and respect and communication and. And Vincent talks about feedback as a as a gift is a very Dutch feature, separating the person from the issue. Um, and across cultures, feedback is is quite seen differently, done differently. And maybe we can pick up on that in um, the Q and A when we start taking questions there. Ahmed, thank you for that. I'll I again I'm I'm just watching the time, and I want Pascal to um, Pascal coming to you as a leader. This also relates very much to the football world. But one of the questions I'd love to ask you is, you know, we have such egos, right? Football is full of egos. Leadership is full of egos. Um, and I'd love to ask this question of you that in leadership, how do you see as a leader, how do you see, how do you deal with star performers? How do you do with, deal with low performers? Um, how, you know, if you see someone who, is too much ego and wants to take all the limelight and creates a rather toxic environment. What, what would you do with something like that? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with ego as a leader? Yeah, so, uh, and I think there are several pieces to, to that question because ju just for to start with star performer, you can have star performers that are really humble people who will not be, uh, who won't have like big egos on the in the team, et cetera. And with them, you can you, you would definitely lead them differently than somebody who is a star performer, but also uh, like we what we call a diva, for instance. Um, and so usually, uh, at least in my experience, what I have seen when I have star performers on my team who are humble, who don't have like big egos, the way I lead these people is not very different from the way I would lead the other people. Of course, they need to know that they are a star performer. You cannot just say, oh, you're the same as the other one. So they need to be recognized for the fact that they are uh, that they have a star performance. But at the same time, you cannot single them out um, to, for the rest of the team. So it cannot be that because this guy is performing very well, he will be allowed to do this and not the other people. We, we should always refrain from doing that, obviously. And, so in my experience, and, and I can uh, take an example from very recently where I had a very junior person starting on my team and very, very quickly, like within 18 months, he, he became like the star performer on that team to the point where today he was, um, he, 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 became a, he became a manager on my team. And one of, the, one of the ways I was able to nurture him as a star performer uh, is coaching him a lot uh, because he, he really required that. He was like, he kept asking questions to me about, okay, how did I do this? Uh, where did I uh, do something wrong? So he, he was really asking for a lot of feedback and to harm its point. Like giving feedback was essential for him to uh, feel appreciated and to feel that he was, uh, that his performance was recognized the way it should. Uh, and to me, it was also a good way to make sure he was uh, still motivated by what he was doing. Because obviously with star performers, you can have the issue that generally speaking, these are people who are very career driven, goal driven. And so if you're not uh, constantly interacting with them, trying to understand where they're at, do they have enough to do, et cetera, you can lose them uh, and lose them in the bad way. I mean. Uh, on the other hand, if you can if you can develop such people uh, to be your star performer, for me, one of the best results is also to see those people go to other uh, teams in the same company, for instance. Uh, usually, as leaders, we tend to uh, avoid those situations uh, because we don't like to lose our best people. But it, it actually is, a, or at least I see that as a very positive outcome, that somebody you have been able to grow and develop on your team is able to, to go perform on another team because that also speaks to your ability as a, uh, as a leader to uh, grow people. Uh, and like I said, this would be the case of a star performer who is like 
humble, not too much ego, etc. And then we have the other extreme. We have like the star performer who will behave like a diva. And here, uh, for me, it's one one place where you need to go with uh, not compromising, because if you if you if you tolerate that kind of behavior on a team, any team, um, the long term performance basically will be affected. There, there's no question about that. Every time I have been on a team where it was tolerated a little bit that somebody could be disrespectful with people, that they could have their way, uh, that they would not follow processes, this has impacted the team negatively, and the people you needed, you wanted to stay left, basically. And so with those people, uh, what I would usually do is, basically I would set expectations. I would explain that, hey, these are the, the, the expectations for working in that team, uh, this is what I, as the leader, expect from you, and you need to show me that you can work within that frame. If it's not possible, you can't stay on the team. And for me, the, there is no compromise to have. Obviously, it's extremely hard to do in a company because those people are very often the best performers. So when you have to explain to someone, I need these people out, and the guy replies, oh, yeah, but he's exceeding his targets every quarter. How do you mm. how do you deal with that? Because it's basically uh, comparing the, the short-term focus on achieving plans, targets, to the long-term feeling of the team, which is much harder to measure, obviously. Mm. Uh, but, but for me, it stays, at least within the teams I can manage or control, this remains like a, a red line, basically. Right? Yeah. If you're behaving like a diva, yeah, you won't have a future. Mm. Uh, and then with low performers, um, so again, I would be very cautious, uh, um, especially if you start on a team and somebody tells you, oh, this guy does not perform well on the team and uh, you need to be cautious, etc." So my, my experience, especially when I took a role a few years back, uh, it happened to me that everybody came, came to see me uh, and told me, oh, this lady is so bad. And I mean, it was to the point when, where I started on my new job, she had just been demoted as a manager. Uh, and obviously she felt very bad about that. So the first discussion I had with her, I told her, okay, I don't know the background of all this, so I cannot change it for the moment but let's work together and let's see what happens. Uh, and my advice would really be to make your own opinion about whether somebody is really a low performer or not. Because sometimes mm. people might perceive that somebody is a low performer for a number of reasons. In that case, um, that lady was perceived as a low performer because she was just not doing the things she loved to do uh, in, a, in a company. As soon as I was able to talk to her, to identify what she wanted to do, what she loved doing, uh, we refocused her on those tasks. And very quickly, she became again uh, a mm -hmm. good performer. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for me, again, low performer, mm -hmm. let's be cautious with what people tell us about people. I think it's always good to make your own opinion. And then it's always good also to make sure you have tried everything. Because sometimes people need training, sometimes they need coaching, yeah. uh, sometimes they are not clear about what their goals are, yeah. what their job is. Um, and if you if you don't go through those things first, you might ask someone to leave your team and someone who is a very good person. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic, Pascal. Uh, really, really good points. And um, I'm just going to summarize some of the things I heard is that you're motivating, you're working with each of them differently, right? So the star performer you're dealing with in a different way, it's acknowledging that they are bringing value. And, and th that's also what they want. They want to hear that recognition that they are being yeah, exactly. seen. For the, for the ones who are um, the, you know, egos, star performers with a lot of egos, it is setting yeah. expectations. And, and, and talking about what performance means. And it struck a memory for me that some, um, uh, in some cases where uh, you have a, a large ego of someone, sometimes it's giving them the sense of what's the bigger picture here. Um, you know, how, how do you, you, you're a good performer, you're a great performer, but take that one step further to look at the bigger picture, 
not only talk about me, myself, and I, but we, how do we achieve something? And somehow getting them to, to have a larger sense of the, uh, of the bigger picture sometimes helps. And you did talk about the low performers not to take secondhand information, really get to understand what's, what the issue is, what the cause is, and identify that. So thank you. That was really um, very useful how you highlighted and, and uh, brought these aspects out. Um, let's go to uh, the q and A. I I know we have some questions. Um, and I, what I'll do is, if you do have other questions, please pull them in here. Uh, what I'll do is just pull up the question. We have a question from Megla, which is, how do you pull up a team's morale when failure seems imminent? Who'd like to take that one? Kat, go ahead. So I have experience in this because uh, when we first started with the national team, obviously we were not going to become World Cup winners overnight. And uh, the first game I had as a head coach was against the U.S. national team. So it was two weeks of training, you know, two, one month of finding players from all over the Iran. And I was literally picking them up from the streets and from the parks. I'm like, have you ever played football? You look like you can be a tough player. And they're like, no, but we would love to play. So I would bring them over. Train them for two. I trained them for two weeks, and I was headed off to Italy. First game against the U.S. Uh, we knew we were going to lose, but I did tell the girls, "Let's go have fun. Let's go do the best that we can." I know we've just like learned how to play a little bit of football. We just learned how to put a pass together. If we can get three passes together, that is the same as one goal. And uh, you know, always uh, reaching those little tiny golden nuggets is, has always been helpful, but. You have to understand that your competition, um, are you able to succeed with it? Are you, have you, do you have the hard work behind it? Did we able to, you know, it, it's not a miracle to go beat the US team after two weeks of training, but you can have fun. And the girls honestly did have a great time. Um, the, the US national team, uh, they, they scored eight goals against us, but it could have been a lot worse. Um, just after two weeks of training against the world's best team. But you have to, to remind the girls that it is just a sport. It is just for fun. We are here to learn and to observe the best teams in the world. Um, I think that is one of the, the prime examples I have for this question. Yeah, thank you, Kat. And, and I mean, you know, hearing the stories about the women's national team, it was a new sport. As you say, they, they also didn't feel they're going to go out and you know, win immediately. And, and it was um, culture building. It was building the sense of football in Iran, I think, and giving them a sense of pride as well for what they can accomplish. Um, how about, I just wondered when I saw that question, what about when you're actually on the pitch and you feel you're going to lose? How, how do you keep morale up when you, I wonder, how does that work? I mean, as if for the Asian games, for example, uh, we were losing 1-0 against uh, Vietnam. But uh, I mean, for 90 minutes as a head coach, like I am on the sideline and it takes a lot to, my assistant coach has to like pull me back to not put me, let me go on, run on the field and start playing. But it's, it's the energy. I mean, as, as most of you have experienced, um, whether you go to a stadium or whether you are, you know, enjoying something that you, you love a lot, it's that energy, it's that um, positive vibration and wavelength that you're sending to your team. It's the constant, you know, it's the yelling, it's not the yelling of anger, it's the yelling from excitement, it's the yelling from like getting your team to stay on their tippy toes to make sure that they're able to, you know, stay on target with their, um, with their goals of what they have to do. And being on the field, that is where it's, uh, the girls know that I will not let them come off the field unless they have given me 110%. Um, even if we're losing, if, even if we're close, I mean, whenever you as a coach are there to give them a, like all the energy you have, they will come out of it very strong. They will most likely score. And, and if, if they don't score, there's going to be a million chances that they, they were very close to score. But um, you just, you cannot sit back and relax and sit on your seat and be really sad and mad that, oh, I'm losing. It's, it's not about you. It's about them. It's about the bigger picture of what we are all fighting for. And they, they know that because we have trained that. It's been a consistent psychological training that the girls are there to 
um, to win a title, to make a difference, to become the next uh, generation of leaders for the country. They know it's not just a game, it's something much bigger than, um, you know, than playing football. But I mean, I, I hope I was able to, to mm. answer that. But it, as far as a coach, it's just about that, um, that energy that you're going to bring to to the team. Yeah. And thank you, because you, you said that so well. It is that energy management as well. And, and it, it reminded me of not only that clip we showed initially about the I, Icelandic team and how they came back, they, they lost in that UEFA champion um, in, the, in the game, but they came back as winners. So the country cheered for them. Uh, so there's so many examples we just had in, in the UEFA matches now, um, Austria lost against Italy. And it was really funny because Austria scored a goal. See, I actually watched that game. Austria, they thought they scored a goal. It was offside. And I mean, of course, all the Austrians went wild and crazy cheering. And then they realized it was offside. So they lost okay. it. But they came back as winners. They yeah, I mean, back. just like the, another example from the Euros is Ukraine uh, versus Sweden. Uh, Shevchenko, I mean, as a, he was a player, now he's a coach. But you can see in his attitude and in the way he motivates his players that they are fighting for much more than football. Uh, when they won yesterday, even I cried, and I'm not even Ukrainian, but you just feel that passion. You feel that that struggle that they have gone through for all yeah. these years yeah. to try to make it out of the, you know, the bottom of the, of, of the, as a team in, from Europe, who's never really gotten that far in a very long time. But uh, as a coach, you know, I think he's done a wonderful job and uh, he's, he's probably one of the main reasons and indicators that that team is going to go and continue to go forward. Yeah. Thank you, Kat. Ahmed, you're smiling, and I know you want to add something over there, so go ahead. <laughs> yes, actually, the, the, the stories that Kate has mentioned um, remind me with a couple of things. I, I always remember that uh, uh, old football fans can see the, the head coach on the line, always talking to their players and, and put, saying, uh, making this. This means that keep focusing on the target, regardless mm -hmm. what's happening, keep focusing on what you have to do. The players to each other, they are actually talking to each other like this. Keep focusing. Don't lose your energy in other stuff. So this is this is one point. The second point regarding Chevchenko, because I was watching the game, and surprisingly, Chevchenko, the, the head coach of Ukraine, who is the one who missed the last penalty in the game that I use as an example, AC Milan and Liverpool 2004. He was the best. Uh, scorer in the world and he was going to um, play the last penalty and that thing and he missed it and Liverpool won mm. and his picture by losing after losing this penalty and losing the, the, the cup was actually as an mar uh, as a sign for everyone don't give up this guy has missed a very important game because of one shot yeah. but he didn't lose his career he moved moved on and he moved or actually transferred to another club in I guess Chelsea or something like that in, in UK and he moved forward and keep moving yeah so uh, Chevchenko for me is uh, a model that we can rely on although that I'm not really convinced uh, on him about as a coach but as a player no question yeah Nice, thanks. A similar um, example can also be used for Kylian Mbappe. He's uh, deemed to be one of the best players in the world, and he missed his penalty for France to move forward. And that that's going to take a while to get over. But um, as a player and you know role model, he needs to figure out how to come out of it stronger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really good point, Kat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to Joe's question. We have two more questions here, which I'd like to take, and I know we, we're, we're a little behind on our time. Joe asks um, that he'd like to hear some thoughts on the role of leadership on the pitch. And he's talking about people like Granit Zaka talking to his team before the penalties versus the France game. Um, I can give a... Yes, Pascal. Uh, so my pitch will be there like a meeting room maybe. Oh. <laughs> uh, but it, it, so what I found in the corporate world is one very important thing to, uh, and I was talking about that when I introduced myself, like to cement the team, it's 
sometimes to lead the leader to let the leadership to other people on the team. So okay, if I lead a team, I'm considered the leader, and uh, so people will come to me for uh, all the disciplinary stuff, etc. They know that uh, I will have their annual reviews with them, etc. But on the other hand, that does not mean I know everything. That does not mean I need to decide everything. That does not mean um, I always have to make the one, I always have to be the one making the decisions. And for me, it's really key to create that environment in the team where everybody feels they can lead at times. Mm. Because sometimes, depending on the situation, people will trust other people than me as the, as the leader because i don't know because they've worked with somebody for 10 years and so when that guy will talk they will listen to him uh, and i think that's probably what happened for instance uh, during that game between france and switzerland that so um uh, chaka is also the captain of the swiss team but he made the talk the the coach was not really there to make any more talk at this point he led the players between them yeah. And I think it's also important in the corporate world to uh, let that happen. Uh, so for me, for instance, one thing I often do with my teams is I do like lunch and learn sessions where the entire team comes, but I'm not the one talking. I just just here to keep time to uh, ask one or two questions, but then we decide on the subject and I let the team discuss that subject between them. And then they make decisions, they find solutions, yeah. they, and that motivate them also. To do that. Yeah. yeah, that's that's wonderful. And and actually, Joe just writes a comment uh, below that Granit Zaka is an example of a natural leader. Um, Joe's a big fan, and he's giving you credit, Pascal. You're right that you have to allow these natural leaders to do what's best. Yeah, very good point. Um, now we have two more questions. I'm going to quickly go through this. Ali asks a question for either uh, all three of you but we're gonna only get one person to answer, I think. In a time or place when leadership is handed out and not necessarily earned, how do you ensure trust and cooperation of team members apart from their own agenda and the team? And how do you, um, how long does it take for the team to accept you as a leader and not just a guy giving out orders, a guy or a gal giving out orders? Who'd like to take that? Very hard question. What, Ahmed? I'm saying that it's a very hard question to answer. Okay. Because it's very sensitive. You know that missing the trust in, in a, because again, back to the point of someone who will be in a position uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, he's leading because of his position, mm. not because of his, uh, he's a leader, a real leader. So he's putting on this this position, leading this department, means that he would lead, but the the, the team is not convinced that mm. this guy can be so um, can be the leader. So they are losing the trust. Mm. And I mean, this is go ahead. Sorry. And this is actually coming because of um, he's giving orders, and he needs things to be done as he can see not giving any room to anyone to talk, to suggest, to think differently. Yeah. Um, and it ended up that the team will know the right and wrong, but they will do what the, what he, the, the leader is asking for regardless. And it's not for a benefit for anyone. Mm -hmm. We have started losing the, the resources in uh, uh, one by one. They, they are not going to focus on what they are supposed to do. They just focus on how to satisfy this person. Yeah, thank it's you. up and nothing. Yeah, thank you, Ahmed. Kat, you wanted to add something, and then Pascal. It's a really hard question. Um, I think uh, the best. I've actually. I have not been personally in this position, but I have worked with someone who all of a sudden became the uh, president of a federation and didn't have prior experience was just kind of put into that position but she tried she really tried she would uh, be the first person in the office last person to leave the office she was always trying to educate herself she would always call me and the other coaches to get our opinion about certain matters but um you know she 
if you're put in that position, you definitely have to do a lot more outreach and prove yourself of a worthy leader where people would want to listen to you, especially if you're going to give orders. Um, that, I mean, that's the only thing that I can really say in regards to that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kat. Pascal, you wanted to add something as well? Yeah, so, so two points I would like to make is, so one very important point is very many people in companies um, confuse uh, being a star performer or performing well with, uh, in order for me to be successful, I need to be a manager. And I've seen so many examples of people who are managers and who tell me that uh, they don't like managing people, etc. So, and the question is, okay, why are you a manager then? Because yeah. that's, that's the bulk of your job, basically, to manage people. And I mean, I can remember a lady on my team when I started in Germany here five years ago. She had been put in a manager position because she was the best of all the team. And it was a little bit a disservice to her because all the people on the team were our friends. She was very young, so people trusted her, but still she had a hard time making the, the shift to manager. And at some point I needed to have a discussion with her where I asked her, hey, do you want to be a manager? Because if you want to be a manager, this is what you must do and I will help you do that. If you don't, if you don't want to be a manager, that's okay too. I just need to know because you, you are, if you continue as a manager and if you don't want to, to be a manager, you will get in a burnout basically. So it's, I think the first thing to uh, create that trust is to make sure that the people you manage want to manage because otherwise you cannot create those connections with people. And the second thing also that I see is very important is uh, the credibility that you bring. So that again, that does not mean you need to know everything, but credibility for me, it's like, okay, you start as the leader of the team, you can deliver small results for the team, you can listen to them, you are consistent also with how you manage uh, them. So you help them. In a sense, it's like you are in service of them instead of coming as the leader and I am giving orders and you have to obey those orders. Yeah. For me, that would not be the definition of a leader. Yeah. Very good points. Thank you, all of you, for sharing that. There is one last question um, from Anas. And it's a, it's a question to Pascal. Um, if there, the question is, if there is a quick fix solution a manager can take when he has a high performer, but a toxic team player? That's a tough one too. That's a, yeah, that's a tough one because, um, because obviously it depends on the situation. But for me, the quick fix is to talk to the person. Yeah. So you have to talk. Uh, explain the, how you see the situation, like what you think the impact is on the team. Uh, I mean, and it's also a great way for a leader to show some vulnerability uh, because that's also how you can create a lot of trust uh, in a team. So if as the leader, you uh, talk to the person and you say, hey, this is how I feel when I see you doing that. And um, now I'm seeing that uh, I cannot achieve the goals for the team, etc. How how can we do? Like, what should we do to uh, to correct this? The the person, I mean, in most cases, will feel compelled to help. Mm. Um, and, but, but essentially, that would be the quick fix. You have to talk to the person, and again, like I said, set expectations. Also, that yeah. this yeah. must stop because otherwise, yeah, the, that can uh, derail a team very quickly if you let a toxic uh, person on the team. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's always a hard one, Pascal. And I, I remember quite a few uh, team players who are these uh, high performers, but difficult people. And, and I, I sort of keep coming back to the, the, the word ego because there are egos and it is managing people through that. So um, not always easy. And at the end of the day, it is speaking to them and trying to set those expectations and talk about performance. Yeah. yeah, and that's a great point, Joe, what you are saying, because for instance, in, uh, uh, yeah. so in, um, in 96, when France was starting having a very competitive football team, the trainer at, the, at this time removed Eric Cantona from the team. He was the best player, mm. but he was, he was a toxic person and he removed him and everybody 
like was on the back of the of yeah. the coach for like two years until France became world champion in 98. And then potentially people started realizing, oh, it might have been a good thing to remove him because yeah. then the team cemented. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. I'm going to close the round of questions and I know we only have 10 minutes left. I, we had a one line story that we wanted to share with you. Uh, and I'm not sure we're going to have time for that. Uh, I'm going to do it a little bit reverse, if you don't mind. So what I'd like to do is do a quick screen share. Um, and Khadija, would you kindly do a screen share? Ferdinand, I see your hand up. Does that mean you have a question? You did have a question. Um, okay. Yes, you, you, you sort of mentioned what did Ferguson do to Gascoigne and that he was removed from the team. Yes, okay, and you're, you're talking about, and, and Kat, okay, you're, you guys are sharing that, you did the same. Um, I wonder, Khadija, if we can do our word cloud first. And what we'd like to invite you to do is we'd love to just get your impressions of this discussion. And so in our chat box, could you go to this um, link and enter this number here, which is our, uh, so it's slido.com and you need the hash tag 714-400. And just tell us words. What are you taking away from the session? What's your learning? Ferdinand, you write inspiration. Yeah. Football is about leadership. Inside track. Mm -hmm. The need to explore more. Is that meaning that we need more time? Is that what you meant? <laughs> um, football is about leadership. Motivate individually. Psychology is important. And the complexity of leadership, absolutely. It is so complex. Um, focus on goal. Yeah. I mean, Ferdinand, you write this, and that's fine also. If you want to just add it in the chat box, that's fine. Football is a simple game. It's, it's a simple game, and yet there's so much complexity to it, right? It's things like mental toughness. It's things like energy management. Um, yeah, the ball has to go into the net and, and, and we, it, it, it seems so simple, right? So some of the words that you bring out over here is uh, energy, trust, um, grit, um, cohesion, resilience. Yeah, so many, it, the energy despite losing, so true. The dedication to leadership. And some, some of the, the words that also, you know, you were talking about lead, don't give orders. Um, and, you know, you talked a little bit about this, the trust, the, the respect over there. It definitely, I agree with you, Joe, it needs a, a lot more time. There are many aspects and I know we just sort of touched not even the tip of the iceberg, but the, the beauty of it is, is just getting the discussion going. Uh, and it's, it's just so exciting to have you all share this. Yeah. So lovely words over here, tenacity, trust came in as well. Um, showing vulnerability, thank you. Thank you, beautiful, beautiful words. Um, we, we will share this in our word cloud to you when we um, send you a summary of the document of, of the presentation. Um, and what we would just like to leave you with as well, uh, exciting, we actually found a company, AQR International. Um, they have a um, mental toughness questionnaire. So we, we've actually been able to um, talk to them Khadija, we might still share that screen if you don't mind. Um, 
And basically, if you'd like this, this will send you the information. There is a link to do a mental toughness assessment, which you can do for yourself as an individual, or you can do for your team. Have a look at that. We've also tried to put together um, a, a sort of a leadership. We've called it a leading with the mental toughness and team spirit. So yes, these are the things we'd like to leave you with. We put together this great playlist on inspirational songs. So great to share that with you. It will be a collaborative playlist. So anything that you can add to it yourselves, we'd love to hear. We also have, believe it or not, a reading list on mental toughness. So we share that with you. You might already have read some books. You might have some more to add. We share with you the psychometric assessment and a program that we've put together for mental toughness and team spirit. And of course, anyone who's attended the VGL events gets a 20% discount on that. Um, the next slide, just to mark the date, we have our next event, which will be on the 22nd, I think, of September. It's going to be Leadership and Millennials. And we're really excited about that. You know, what do we need to do to engage with millennials more? And time-wise, we have five more minutes, so I can close with our one-line sentences with Kat, Pascal, and Ahmed. Ahmed, I'm going to start with you and ask you, one line sentence, respect. What does it mean to you? Code of leadership. It means what? Code of leadership. C code of leadership? Core, core. Core, core of, of leadership. leadership. Respect, beautiful. Um, Pascal, a hard one for you. I want to ask you failure. So you, you want to ask me what I, where I failed at? Or? Where did you fail? Okay, I failed. So I think in one of the first positions when I wanted to be the savior instead of being a leader for the team, I wanted to solve everybody's problems. And that obviously did not go too well. Nice one. Very nice. Thank you. There's a lot of learning in that I can hear. Kat, I'm going to leave the last word for you, which is what is your mantra in times of hardship and mental toughness? You are on mute. mute. I was about to go for a while. Um, so don't let loss or a tough day discourage you. It is in those moments where you find your path forward and your voice and you know what what is the real meaning of uh, that, that loss because you can learn so much from it. But in short, don't let loss or a tough day discourage you. So beautiful, so beautiful. Thank you for those lovely words for this very inspiring VGL forum. Kat, Pascal, Ahmad, a very, very big, big thank you to you. To the rest of the audience, thank you so much. The participants, thank you for being here. We, we really, really valued the fact that you joined us today. Um, keep the conversations going. If there are things that you think we can work on in VGL form, please let us know. It was wonderful to see you here. And look at that. We actually have four minutes. I'm on time. <laughs> We can listen to that playlist now. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>